It's important for us to be aware how we process and communicate our thoughts and ideas so that we can improve our critical thinking. Not only will this help us be more successful with NUX, but also as a member of a team. Hey, what's going on, y'all? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Nanurl, and this is Unpacked Angles with me, where we're focused on widening the perspective on all things UX and more. And today, I want to talk to you about biases and fallacies. Many of these terms are studied in psychology because they're all about the way we think and how we act on those thoughts. Because our goals in UX oftentimes have to do with understanding the people who use or will use our products, user experience and psychology are closely tied. This is the main reason why many organizations who are looking for UXers look for people who have backgrounds in psychology or anthropology. So I'm gonna go into nine biases and fallacies that I think are super important to keep in mind while you're working with people. But before we get into all that, let's go into what biases and fallacies actually are. So a bias is a tendency or inclination against or towards something or someone. Oftentimes these are based heavily in stereotypes and they can either be positive or negative. They help to shape our thoughts and the way that we think about different people, groups, and situations. Whereas a fallacy is a mistaken idea or conclusion due to flawed logic. So fallacies are very closely related to biases and people often use the words interchangeably. But the main difference between the two is that bias has to do with how we collect and interpret information. And that often leads to the flawed logic. Fallacy has to do with how we act on or communicate that information. So biases are more so within our own minds, while fallacies are seen in our behavior or in the way that we communicate our thoughts. It's important for us to be aware how we process and communicate our thoughts and ideas so that we can improve our critical thinking. Not only will this help us be more successful with NUX, but also as a member of a team, which brings us to the nine biases and fallacies that I want to touch on that I think are important to keep in mind and be aware of when you're working on a team and creating a product. So the first bias I want to cover is availability bias. This bias involves the tendency to judge the magnitude or importance of something because of how easily it comes to mind. So when you're creating a product and trying to figure out what features to include, it's super easy to remember something that you just heard about or something that you've heard from multiple people directly. If you are directly hearing something frequently enough, you might fall into that everybody is asking for a trap and think that that's the feature you need to add. But that might not be true. For all intents and purposes, it could be, but you personally will not know for sure. It is much better to go off actual data instead. Being data informed helps us to make the best decisions. The hasty generalization fallacy has to do with drawing sweeping conclusions based on false or inadequate evidence. This is very closely related to the availability bias. It's all about jumping to conclusions based on insufficient evidence. Just because a whole bunch of people are saying it to you does not necessarily mean that that is the best way to go. This is why it is so important to validate information. So look at your data if you have data. And if you don't have data, figure out how you can get data. This can involve doing a lot of user experience research to really understand what's actually needed. However, on the flip side, we have the slothful induction fallacy. This fallacy has to do with failing to acknowledge and come to a conclusion on something, even though there is enough evidence to back it up. Usually in these types of situations, if we're falling victim to it, we are either attributing that evidence to a coincidence or something completely different. It really helps to work with a team of people, especially people who are different from you, so that they can make you aware of things that you're not seeing. Because oftentimes we can miss a whole bunch working just by ourselves. Next, we have the mere exposure effect. This refers to the phenomenon that people prefer things that they are used to. This is psychologically innate within all of us, so it is very easy to fall victim to. It's very closely related to Jacob's Law, which states that people will spend most of their time on other people's sites within other people's products. 
So when it comes to creating a product, the more it looks and behaves like something that people are already used to, the more likely it is to be accepted. People will adapt to that a lot more quickly. They won't have to relearn the basics, which is gonna save them a lot of time. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean straight up copy people. That's not what I'm saying. However, if you are going to change something that is conventional across the board, you need to have a very, very good reason. Next, we have confirmation bias. This bias happens when we embrace information that supports our point of view and reject or just flat out ignore information that's factual that contradicts it. Now, it is very easy to fall into this way of thinking. When we are super passionate about our companies or our product and what we are doing, the problem that we are solving, what we're building, we really need this test to go a certain way so that we can validate our hypotheses or our ideas. Clearly, like this is no good. We cannot do this. It is important to stay as objective as possible. How are we going to improve upon what we have? have already if we're avoiding the information that we need to know what improvements need to be made. Sometimes a pivot is necessary and if you are avoiding all of the information that is pointing you in that direction, you'll never do it. You will be too blinded by all of the good information that you will in turn end up sabotaging your product. Next we have the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Pew pew. <laughs> This one's name, I think, is my favorite. This is closely related to the confirmation bias and comes as a result of that type of thinking process. So the name comes from a story about a Texan who was a sharpshooter, obviously. And the story goes, he shoots into the side of a barn. And after he's finished shooting, he draws a target around his shots and makes the bullseye where the majority of his shots are. So essentially, you know, he's misrepresenting his skills as a shooter. This target that he drew after the fact makes him appear as though he is a good shot. The Texas sharpshooter fallacy has to do with cherry picking information to validate or support your point of view. Here, we're not taking the entire amount of data into account only acknowledging the information that supports the outcome that we want. Obviously, this is no good. Working with cherry-picked information can really land us in a bad place. Not only does it not serve or do us justice or do our product justice, worst case scenario, as you ignore all of the information that you don't want to acknowledge, your product fails or your company fails. And don't let this information get out to the public. Your company, your organization, or you will definitely have some explaining to do. Our organization could be deemed unethical and at a personal level, we can be seen as lacking integrity. And we don't want that. The next fallacy is my favorite fallacy of all time. Shout out econ class, cause that's where I learned it, is the sunk cost fallacy. It's my favorite because I recognize it in all facets of my life. This fallacy happens when we continue to invest in something that no longer serves us because we've already paid for it. That can be payment in time, money, and or effort. Examples of this can be found everywhere. In romantic relationships that we stay in that are no longer good for us, in activities that we continue to do even though we're no longer interested in them, even at that job or on that team that we no longer wish to be a part of. So in the context of building products, if something that we're working on does not prove to be profitable or is maybe taking too long or too much effort to develop, that product may not be worth the investment anymore. But this fallacy makes us want to stick with it, right? Because of the time and the money and the effort that was invested into this thing. But at the end of the day, we have to be real with ourselves and with our team. And this can be one of the hardest decisions to make. So it's definitely not an easy thing to do. And it only gets harder as time passes. So it's better to just stop quickly, you know, cut your losses. Like you can't get that time back. You can't get that money back. You can't get that effort back and that's fine. You just gotta accept it. It's better to stop quickly and then pivot to something that is worthwhile, that is worth your investment, that will better serve you. 
The next and second to last thing I want to talk about is the appeal to authority fallacy. Now, this fallacy has to do with defaulting to what the authority figure in the room says or thinks. Now, of course, this is not fallacious by nature. I'm not saying don't listen to your boss. Don't go to work talking about no neural said not to listen to y'all because that's not what I'm saying. Oftentimes, that authority figure is going to have more experience or at least a better picture of what the company's goals, objectives, and direction are. However, there is a danger of placing all of these decisions, especially in user experience, on what one person thinks. I hear of this happening a lot in freelance UX where your client is a little over zealous. <laughs> I've also heard this within companies that maybe are not as fully developed in their incorporation of user experience research within their design process. Remember, you are not your users. Your boss is not your users. Your client is not your users. Y'all are not your users. Remember that, okay? So just because they say something or believe something, it may not necessarily be true. So how do we combat this, Nanero? You doing all this talking? Well, of course, first step is getting information from actual people. Get out, do your user research. And with that, know what assumptions you're making. Get a clear idea of all of the assumptions that you and your team have and go validate them. Are they actually true or not? And when it comes to organizations or clients that don't necessarily understand user experience research, it unfortunately does fall to us sometimes to educate them. There are many times when it's necessary to apply UX practices within our own organizations and our own teams. We have to understand what they do, how they work, and what they know. What's important to your team? How can you insert user research in there to align with what they think is important already? And then you can go about educating accordingly. Now, I know that this is not going to work in some instances. There are some cases where you're just not going to get any play. We can only do so much. So on top of all of that, you got to know which hill you're willing to die on. As you continue to flourish in your work and keep biases and fallacies at the forefront of your mind, be aware that you will probably not recognize many of the ones that you fall victim to. That brings me to our last topic the bias blind spot. This is the tendency to see ourselves as less susceptible to biases than others. Biases are very easy to spot in other people because we notice it when they act and take part in fallacious behavior. However, it's much harder to check ourselves because we live in our own minds. Therefore, there are a lot of things that we just can't see. We're too close to them. The first place to start is recognizing and acknowledging that everybody has biases. No one on this earth is completely objective. No matter how hard we try, we all have different perspectives. We live in our own worlds. We all have our own mental models. That is the way we know the world and how the things in it work. So once we come to a place of understanding that, we'll be more likely to ask for that second opinion or even ask for feedback on our thoughts and our ideas, no matter how uncomfortable it may make us. Biases and fallacies are rampant, and it's not necessarily a 100% bad thing. But being aware of them and knowing how you think and how you process information and what you do with that information is what's most important. And of course, I have my ending question. So y'all know already because I mentioned it earlier that the sunk cost fallacy is my favorite fallacy. What is one thing that you're thinking about giving up because it no longer serves you? And I'm going to challenge you to go ahead and let it go and not feel guilty about it. Let it go. And so that is all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this episode on biases and fallacies. If you liked what you saw today, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to get notified about when I'm posting, hit that notification bell as well. I post every other Wednesday. And so hit us up with any questions, comments, concerns that you have. Hit me in the comments or you can visit the website at www dot unpexangles.com and while you're there you can sign up for the newsletter i send a newsletter out every couple weeks updating you about the new video and also any resources that i have to provide 
You can also catch us on social media. So if you want to hit us up on Instagram, we're at Unpacked Angles. And I'm on IG and Twitter personally as well. So if you want to hit me up there, I'm at Nanural underscore. Let me know what you're doing, what you're working on, what you got going on. Until next time, y'all, I will catch y'all in the next episode. Deuces. Thank you.